Hello, my name is Dave Jennings and I'd like to welcome you to our third and final class on understanding Bible prophecy. In the first two classes we dealt with fundamentals about Bible prophecy. In class one we talked about God's master plan, a plan which takes a condemned man who is mortal and to return back to the dust of the ground and gives him a hope of salvation a hope of salvation that eventually will lead to the earth being completely filled with the glory of God. That master plan is the fundamental foundation of all Bible prophecy. When we moved to class two, we looked at the promises, which tells us about Bible prophecy, the details of how the master plan will be enacted. We looked at the promises that were in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. Uh, we saw the promise of a seed, a seed of the woman who would conquer sin. Then we moved ahead to Abraham, and we saw the promise to Abraham that through Abraham and his seed, they would inherit the land forever. And then we looked at King David, where he was told that he would see his own seed ruling on his throne forever. And we were able to demonstrate with the help of the Apostle Paul that the seed of the woman who would conquer sin, the seed of Abraham that would inherit the land and the earth forever with Abraham, and the seed that would rule on David's throne forever was one person, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as we move to our last class, we're going to be looking at the miracle of Israel. We're going to look at Israel in prospect. We're going to look at Israel in the future. And we're going to see how God's plan, his master plan, is going to be largely enacted through the nation of Israel. We're going to see how that leads us right into the promised kingdom of God, which will bring about the process that will leave us with a world that is filled with the glory of God. So we're going to look at four topics. First of all, why is Israel important in Bible prophecy? Or another way to put it, is Israel important in Bible prophecy? We'll then look at Israel for a period of time from Abraham to the fall of Jerusalem. And we'll just take a look at how that developed over time. Um, we'll then look at modern times, the, 19, the uh, 1900 to today, the 20th century, and into the 21st century what's been developing, and then finally we'll look at what's ahead in Israel's future. How do they fit in in God's plan? It is incredible when you think about it. You can't open a newspaper, um, go to the internet, watch the news, and not hear something about Israel. Israel is at the center of all things in the earth. People are all concerned with it. A land that is far smaller than the state in the United States I live in, in California. It's much smaller than that, and yet all nations have interests and are connected somehow to Israel. So the question is, why Israel is important in Bible prophecy? Well, I suppose the very first question is, is Israel still important? And this is answered by the Apostle Paul. Now, many people, sometimes Christians, will say, Israel forfeited their standing with God whenever they crucified Jesus. However, this is the Apostle Paul writing probably 20 to 30 years after Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, and ascended into the heavens. What does he have to say about Israel? He says, I say then, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant 
according to the election of grace. So what is the point that Paul's making here? Well, first of all, God has never cast off Israel. And even at times like the time of Elijah, or called Elias here, um, Eli Elijah at one point thought he was the only one left that was still a believer. And God revealed to him that there were 7,000 that he had hidden that were not had not bowed their knee to Baal. And so the message about this is God has always not only preserved Israel, but he's always had faithful remnant, a small remnant that was uh, faithful to him. And this continues even to this day. Now there's many books written about Israel and about the Jewish people. Um, this is one was written by Max DeMont. And what he does is he talks, he takes Deuteronomy, the um, fifth book of the Bible, and he looks at the prophecies of Israel and how their history would unfold. And he sees that it's not only proven by scripture, but also by secular writings and history books. This is what he says. The saga of the Jews is interwoven with the history of virtually every nation on earth. In other words, it touches almost every nation on the earth. The story of a people escaping annihilation and cultural death, fighting, falling back, advancing, infused with an almost miraculous life force, they have survived the death of civilizations. Now that's quite interesting that he would say they've survived the death of civilizations because when we look at the kingdoms that ruled over Israel, the, the um, Egyptians which made slaves out of them, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the, um, the Philistines, the, uh, the Medes and the Persians, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, all these nations would come up as powers, rule over Israel, but they would go away. And of course, the important thing about this is that through all of this, even though Israel went through difficult times, very difficult times, they were never to be ceasing as a people. Now, there has always been a conflict between the children of men and the children of God, the sons of men and the sons of God. And after the flood, we're recorded for us in Genesis chapter 11, that there was a, a, the kingdoms of men that got established. And let's look at the thinking of the kingdoms of men. Now, this is theoretically, or at least believed to be, possibly the um, on the left hand side here pictures of the ruins of the Tower of Babel. Now whether that's true or not there apparently was a temple and this read about it. And they said go to let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Instead of making using God's name they wanted to make their own name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon, upon the face of the whole earth and the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So we see that the children of men, the kingdoms of men, being established all the way back in Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. These were ones that were founded on the promotion of man, humanism, rather than selecting the service of God. And God, in this case, confounded their language and the building of the temple was halted. But you see, those kingdoms of men were exactly what Israel would have gone like, they would have been also scattered if it wasn't that they were God's people. Jeremiah 30, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee, but will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So while all these other nations would come and go, 
Israel was going to be preserved by God, not because of themselves, but by God. But we also know that Israel was going to be regathered in the latter days. This is a promise that they all understood. Fear not, Isaiah 43, verses 5 through 6. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And actually, we've seen this in the last uh, less than a hundred years. We've seen uh, those uh, from all those different directions, the people of Israel returning back to the land. So our first point here is this. Israel has been and continues to be and will be God's people. They have not and are not living up to today this high calling. God is going to preserve Israel for a very special purpose in the future, but they have not lived up to their high calling yet. But why were they preserved? Well, remember the promise to Abraham. It was through Abraham and his seed that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So it's not just that Israel is to be saved, but Israel was going to play an important role in the salvation of all nations. Israel was preserved to be a witness to the world. Isaiah 43, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. At the end he says, I have showed them, I have, sh I have showed when there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. So Israel was to be witnesses, not of themselves, not to be boastful, but rather to be witnesses that God is with them. And we see this today in that God has brought Israel back into the land in just the last several generations. So, Israel's selection. Why were they selected? Well, it wasn't because they were the biggest people. He says, you are a holy people in the Lord your God. The Lord hath chosen thee to be a special people unto him above all people that are on the face of the earth. For the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were the more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. They were actually a people that started by a hundred-year-old man and a ninety-year-old woman in a miraculous birth, which was known as Isaac. But this is the high calling of Israel, and this will be the focus of understanding the Bible prophecy about Israel. This comes out of Exodus 19. It was always the high calling that Israel could have lived up to. Uh, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar or a special treasure unto me above all, my peop above all people. For the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, that's what they're to be. A kingdom of priests means that they will be people who would be involved in the worship. They would be involved in the worship with the nations. And they would be a holy nation, a separate nation. So the way that they were to be was to lead the world in the worship of God and understanding who God is and to be a holy and a separate people. That was their high calling. In fact, in Isaiah 49, they were told to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. It was a high calling for them to be the light to the world. So Israel was to be a light to the world in the way they worshipped the one true God, in their holiness and obedience of his commandments, by reflecting his righteousness and character, by putting their trust in him rather than their economy, uh, or their own military might, and to bring non-believing nations to God. Now this was briefly accomplished in certain periods of Israel's history, but certainly not on an ongoing trend. Now another factor of this is that God showed his power through Israel. He demonstrated not only to Israel, but to all the nations, his miraculous power, whether it be in the plagues in Egypt, the opening up of the Red Sea, uh, the conquest of Jericho. In all these matters, God showed his power through the nation of Israel. 
and it was to not only help Israel to know that he was the God, the only true God, but as we see in Exodus 7 and 9, it was also to be a witness to the Egyptians that they also might know God. And it worked very well because when we get to uh, Joshua coming into the land, to conquest of the land, he, they go to Jericho, and when they go to Jericho, uh, two um, of, we have, there are two Jewish spies who go in to spy out the land. And when they do this, they go into the city, they meet up with Rahab. Rahab was a harlot that was living in the city. But listen to what she says about how God worked with Israel. I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. And down at the bottom of this passage, because of you, for the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So the way that God worked through Israel was something that was taken note by the nations. They were, in this case, in great fear. So Israel's role has been and remains central to God's plan in the earth. Um, they are to be witnesses, to be a light to the nations of the only true God. Now, God's blessings on Israel were conditional. They had to be obedient. But his plan and promises were not conditional. He would never revoke these. And Israel will be redeemed and elevated in the coming kingdom. And they will finally realize and perform the role that God always intended them, which was to be a light to the Gentiles and his witnesses. So what does it mean to us today? Well, first of all, Israel's continued survival is a witness of God's greatness. The fact that Israel is not only a people still, but that they're back in the promised land area, well, that's a witness to us. And they don't exist today because of their own might, their own ability to do it, but because God has permitted this to happen. They are our testimony to the world of his power and of his control of the world. And it's therefore a call for all nations right now and in the future to worship the God of Israel. We're going to take a brief history le lesson here from the time of Abraham about 4,000 years ago to 70 AD, which was the fall of the city of Jerusalem to the Romans. Well, remember that this nation started with a miracle. It started by the birth of Isaac to a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman, well beyond childbearing years. But God's nation, it wasn't started haphazardly. It was specifically chosen. Abraham is singled out, and he's given the promises. Now, Abraham and Sarah have a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac um, has, after he marries Rebekah, has twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the oldest, but does not perform the role of the priest for the family. And so Jacob is the one that the promise goes through. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob himself has 12 sons and one daughter. And we know that those 12, those 12 sons now represent the 12 tribes of Israel and will continue to be referred to throughout uh, the Bible. Now, just a brief history. We started off talking about Abraham. Uh, again, he lived about 4,000 uh, years ago, about 2,000 years before Christ. And Abraham is talked about in Genesis. Moses is talked about in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In Joshua, we have Joshua taking the people from the wilderness after being there 40 years into the promised land and conquesting cities uh, as an example Jericho. After that period the judges arise and the judges were ones who judged according to the law but also were in charge of the spiritual development of the nation. First, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles are all talking about the period of the kings starting with King Saul, then King David, then Solomon, 
And then after that, the kingdom was split into the northern and then the southern uh, uh, tribes. Um, the northern being ten tribes and the southern being known as the tribe as the, the kingdom of Judah was just two tribes. Well, the Babylonian captivity, um, it happens at the fall of the very last king, King Zedekiah. He was a wicked king, and that was the end of those people ruling over the, um, the, the throne of David. It, it ceases. And for 70 years, there's Babylonian captivity, which then is ended when people like Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, the high priest, and Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai, and Zechariah, all these uh, prophets are involved in the period of time where Israel goes back into the land while they're under Persian control, rebuilds the temple, and then eventually rebuilds the city of Jerusalem. But after that time, once we get to Malachi, after that time there are 400 years of silence. There are 400 years where there is no prophet, and that is ended finally when John the Baptist appears in the Jordan Valley. But what happened to them then? See, God had promised the Messiah, a deliverer, a righteous ruler, to his faithful children. But God, through his prophets, encourages people to be uh, obedient and faithful, trusting and patient. But they didn't exhibit any of these characteristics. The prophesied destruction came upon them. And Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus in AD 70 when he came in and not only invaded the city, but ended up burning it. And this was uh, the end of the Jews having their own rule or their own presence and occupation of the land. Well, we're now going to sp spend uh, uh, way up to the uh, 20th century, to uh, 1900, until today, and we're going to see what role Israel has played. And this has been exciting. Well, first of all, prophecy declares that Israel has to be in the land. Remember, Israel hasn't ruled over itself since 604 BC, and Israel's occupation of the land ended in 70 AD, but the Bible requires that when Jesus returns, Israel will be back in the land. So a major part of Jesus' work is to save and to redeem Israel. So that's what's been seen since the past century. What has been seen is very significant. It's very significant to Bible students because Israel back in the land tells us that Jesus can return to the earth at any time. Now, the Jews didn't have occupation of the land. The, the Turks had occupation of the land, and it was the British who came in and systematically removed the Turkish uh, troops out of the land of Palestine. First, um, we see here on the left, uh, British General Allenby going in and removing the Ottoman Turks from Jerusalem. And on the right-hand side, we can see the Balfour Declaration being signed on December 2nd, 1917. What this was doing is establishing Palestine as the home for the Jewish people. And they could do that because Britain at that time had been given control by the League of Nations to, uh, uh, to have control over what was not only Palestine but Transjordan. And they made the, declare, they, the declaration that Israel would move back to Palestine. That would become their homeland. Well, many Jews didn't leave, didn't leave. They were comfortable. They were successful in many of these lands. And great persecution of the Jews began in Germany and the Russian Federation particularly. And the Holocaust happens in the 1930s through the mid-1940s where six million people are killed in Europe through the Holocaust. And after the completion of the war, then the Iron Curtain drops over Eastern Europe, separating Eastern Europe from, uh, from the West. But we know that what we were able to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. In Jeremiah 31, at verse 8, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travails with child together, a great company, 
shall return thither. And this is exactly what we were able to see. As this map depicts, uh, there was Jewish immigration that came from all over in Russia, Latvia, Poland, throughout Eastern Europe, into Central Europe, even all the way over to the UK, where you saw uh, many of these Jews who would begin to immigrate back into the land. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, there were also many who um, went to the Americas. Still to this day, the largest Jewish city in the world is New York City. Well, fast forward to uh, May 14th, 1948. Israel is declared a state on May 14th, 1948. There you have a picture of David Ben-Gurion reading this pronouncement. And interestingly, the nations had to rule on this, and Israel was supported by governments like the United States. This is a document from Harry Truman, where he approved on May 14, 1948, this government of Israel. And it reads, this government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in, Jeruth in Palestine, and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority in the new, and he wrote in, State of Israel. And so the State of Israel as a self-governing, occupying country was reinstated, and it had not been that way since 70 AD. Well, today, Israel. Israel today is not the promised Israel. It is Israel. It is natural Israel, but it's not the promised Israel. Today, Israel still largely is dependent on its own might, its own commerce, its own military, and its own alliances. And a large segment of the people aren't even religious. In fact, many are atheistic. It's not operating as a light to the Gentiles. But in order for this Bible prophecy to be fulfilled, and in order for them to be redeemed, they had to come back to the land. So this then sets the stage that believers over the centuries have been waiting for. So what about Israel in the future of God's plan? Well, what we've seen so far is the nation of Israel is irrevocably connected to the promises of Abraham and David. Israel was called to be a light to the Gentiles, a witness to the world of the true God. And Israel must be back in the land at the return of Jesus. Israel today is not fulfilling their appointed role, but the Bible tells us this is all about to change. Because of their failures, not living up to being this calling, uh, being just like the nations around them, rejecting God as their king, they weren't effective witnesses, and they didn't remain to be faithful witnesses so that people in the world would be able to know God. That's their failure. But... God has not cast them off. He still is their God and has a firm plan to redeem them. This is really a major key to Bible prophecy. Paul continues on that chapter 11 that we were reading earlier. And he goes on to say, I don't want you to be ignorant on this, of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be concerned. He says, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so... All Israel will be saved. If you jump down to the last part, it says, As far as the gospel is concerned, they are your enemies. They are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. For God's gifts and his, and his call are irrevocable. So certainly God has not cast away Israel. They are still his people. This beautiful passage in Isaiah 60 talks about what the world will be like when Israel is living up to this responsibility. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and the king's and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then 
you will look to be and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of nations will come. So this is a view of redeemed Israel, where the light of the nations will be shining on them. Ezekiel 37 continues about an everlasting company, uh, covenant that he will set his sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. And the heathen, the nations, will know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. But what has to change? They can't continue to be a secular nation like now. They have to recognize and accept Jesus. They must become a model to all the nations of a holy people, righteous living, and they must lead the nations in worship and be a kingdom of priests, helping men and women to know God. But the Bible teaching about restoration is pretty clear. God will restore Israel, establish a government under Christ, and provide for worship. And all nations will participate with Israel in the new order of government and worship. And all nations will go up at least annually to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and to worship. And the plans for that temple and what it will actually look like are provided for us in Ezekiel 40 through 48. But scripture describes the conversion of Israel, a powerful uh a powerful scene is depicted for us in Jeremiah 12, where Israel comes face to face with Jesus, who has come back and delivered them in the last days. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. So this will be a difficult time for Israel. They'll get saved by the Lord Jesus from the trials of the last days. But then they'll also recognize that the one that saved them in, indeed was the Messiah, the Messiah that they crucified. But it will be a time which will allow them to be forgiven of their sins, and they will mourn for what they have done. But in Isaiah 52, it says that also all the earth is going to see the salvation of God. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Israel will be physically restored. Behold, the days come. This is Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So physically Israel will be restored. They will prosper they will be at a time of peace and they will dwell safely. You could hardly say that about Israel today. But the rebirth of Israel will largely be spiritual. God will give them a new covenant. And as it says at the end of this passage, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Even uh, the 12 apostles had a promise that they themselves would be given the rule of the twelve thrones of Israel, uh, of uh, on twelve thrones and judging over the twelve tribes of Israel, and so even in the kingdom age, when the apostles are reigning uh, in Jerusalem, they will reign uh, sitting on the throne of uh, on twelve thrones, judging over these twelve tribes of Israel. So the twelve tribes are being ruled by the twelve apostles. The king will be Jesus sitting on David's throne. The worldwide capital will be in Jerusalem, and Israel, which will be God's peculiar people, peculiar special people, will be restored as the spiritual leaders and witnesses to the nations. And the gospel message will be fully realized in Abraham's seed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. And the nations themselves will be redeemed 
which will fulfill the promise that was given to Abraham in Genesis 22. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. This is what Paul said, was the gospel message preached before unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. There will be the redemption of the nations. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. What a beautiful view this is of Israel, along with the nations, serving God. I love this passage because it gives the view of how important Israel will be to the spiritual well-being of the nations. Uh, Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 through 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall come, yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That is Israel, not only being witnesses, but being a kingdom of priests to the world. In Jeremiah 3, verse 17, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. And finally, when this kingdom is established, all nations will know and worship God. All power will be vested in one central authority under the Lord Jesus Christ, ruling as the worldwide king. War will cease. Righteousness will replace the wickedness that we see in the earth today. And poverty will be banished along with all of the environmental concerns that we have today. Countless messages about the kingdom and what will happen. So in summary, Israel is God's chosen people, selected from the children of Abraham. Israel has suffered due to, re to rebellion spiritually, and because of this, while God protected them as a people, he also would try them and uh, punish them. Jesus Christ is to eventually redeem Israel to lead global worship of God as originally intended, as a light to the Gentiles. All nations will be eligible to share in the wonderful conditions and to worship God. In Israel, as God, God's witnesses, then are a very sure sign for anybody today reading Bible prophecy of the validity of, pro of prophecy and why we should be excited that we live in the last days. I want to thank you very much for your attention during these sessions. I hope it was useful to you. Uh, we went through a lot of verses, but I hope it gives you a flavor of how the Bible is consistently talking about the, the fundamentals of God's master plan, the promises, and the prophecies that tell us the details of how that will happen. Now, undoubtedly, you would like to know more about this coming kingdom of God and what you can do to be part of that. Well, I would highly recommend that you go to a website which is called www.thisisyourbible.com. This is a fabulous website full of many uh, great periodicals you can read on the Bible subjects. Uh, you can get your own questions answered live by somebody. Uh, there are Bible courses that you can take, all of which is free of charge. Please take advantage of it. You know, we live in such exciting times. Many people live their whole lives hoping that they would see what we are seeing in our life. Let's not be filled with malaise. Let's not take this without any urgency. Let's recognize that God is calling us to be his people. He's calling us to be part of a world which progressively 
under the rule of Jesus Christ will be filled with the glory of God. And may we each in our own lives live up to that high calling. And we pray that God's blessing will be with you. Thank you. God bless.